going to be from Proverbs chapter 4, 1 through 6. Before we have our reading, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord in heaven, we're thankful for the day that we've been given and the opportunity it is to come into your presence. We're thankful, Father, for the hour at hand, the chance it is to worship our great God. We're thankful, Father, for those in attendance. We're mindful for those that are not. We ask, Father, that you'll stand with us Stand behind us, strengthen us, and support us. We're thankful, Father, for the men that are able to stand today, raise our voices in song, the ones that are able to lead prayer, provide the message, and prepare the table. We ask, Lord, that as we take on this hour, that as we worship and submit to you, that we do so with an open heart, an open mind, that the message can pierce us, change us, move us, and motivate us. We ask that you stand with Clay as he presents it. We ask that you stand with him, that he presents it, and shares it, provides it in spirit and truth. These things are asked in Jesus' name. Amen. To prepare our minds for Clay's message. We're going to hear from Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget, do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. We're so glad that you're here. We're so grateful for an opportunity to be together in person and online. And those who are watching the recording, Lord willing, uh, we're thankful for every Lord's Day. 
And we're thankful today as well uh, to honor our fathers. We're grateful for our guests. I know Cecil is delighted to have his family with him, and we're delighted that you're here with us today. For as long as I can remember, I have wanted to be a father. Now, maybe that's because I had two younger siblings growing up. But uh, as you know, uh, this year, that desire became reality with the birth of our son, Amos. And today he is 11 weeks old. And in 11 weeks, we have... Uh, we have learned, Jessica and I, more than we anticipated. (laughs) And he has grown and changed more than we could have imagined in 11 weeks' time. Uh, We have only just begun the process of parenting, but we thank God for the opportunity and the responsibility that he has given us to raise our son. In 1 Kings chapter 2, we find a father who ought to know quite a bit about raising children. According to 1 Chronicles chapter 3, he had at least 19 sons and one daughter. But he probably had more children than that. He was... A king. He was a man after God's own heart, according to 1 Samuel chapter 13 and Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And even though he was a king and a man after God's own heart, he had his fair share of mistakes in raising his children, some of which were very costly. And of course, we're talking about King David. In 1 Kings chapter 2, he is on his deathbed. And he has brought his son Solomon to him to give him final instructions before he dies. Now the latter portion of those instructions that begin in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 5 deal with politics and even the dirty business of vengeance. But in 1 Kings chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 we find David addressing his son on a personal level. What I'd like for us to do this morning is to notice the three instructions that David gives to his son Solomon on his deathbed. Three instructions that I believe are relevant to all of us, whether we are male or female, son or daughter, father or mother, or brother or sister, or what have you. And I'm going to admit to you as we go through this sermon that I need it uh, as I think about raising my son. Let's read 1 Kings chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. The inspired writer says, When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God walking in His ways and keeping His statutes, His commandments, His rules, and His testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish His word that He spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel." I can imagine as Solomon wrote Proverbs 1-10, through the instructions to his own sons, that he thought back to the instructions that he received from his father David. As Sid read for us a few moments ago from Proverbs 4, and he said, When I was but a, a child, my father taught me. And I can imagine Solomon thinking back to this occasion that we're looking at together. Let's notice the three things that David emphasized to Solomon in these verses. We see first of all in verse 2 that David instructed his son Solomon to pay attention to himself physically. Now that's not the wording, of course, of verse 2. 
Instead, David says to Solomon, Be courageous. Be a man. Now, it's likely that Solomon was very young when David died. In fact, if you've got your Bible open to 1 Kings chapter 2, turn over just a page or so to chapter 3. And hear what Solomon says of himself in verse 7. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to come in or how to go out. We don't know how old Solomon was when David died. The text does not give us a specific age but it's likely that he was not very old. David, in his time as as king, had experienced a number of threats to the throne, both from those outside as well as from within his own family. His own son Absalom had attempted a coup, which cost him his life. Just before David died, another of his sons attempted to name himself as the king as soon as David passed. And it was only through the efforts of the prophet Nathan and Bathsheba, David's wife, that Solomon was ultimately named king. And so David probably anticipated that his young son would have to fight to keep the throne. And in so doing he would also be fighting for his very own life. Because you probably know that anyone who had a claim to the throne was often put to death in order to prevent that claim from coming to be. Some commentators suggest that David's words here in 1 Kings 2, 1-4 through are a reflection of what Joshua told the children of Israel in Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, as he prepared to take them into the promised land. He told them to be strong and courageous as they went into that land to take it as the Lord had commanded. Now what that would suggest, if David in fact is reflecting these words, is that he understood that Solomon was about to undergo a difficult and even violent time in his life. And in fact, as we get into verses 5 and following, we find that David does command him to commit bloodshed to secure the throne. One very well-known commentator, Albert Barnes, wrote concerning these verses, Solomon's youth clearly constituted one of the chief difficulties of his position. To have to rule over the warlike and turbulent Hebrew nation with a strong party opposed to him and brothers of full age ready to lead it was evidently a most difficult task. Hence he is exhorted, though in years a boy, to show himself in spirit a man." Now at this point, we may be saying, well, what in the world does this have to do with us? My son will never be a king. Uh, None of us will probably ever find ourselves in any position quite like the one that David was in and that Solomon was in on this occasion. But at the very core, what David was attempting to do in verse 2 was to protect his son's life. It is the responsibility of every father to provide for and protect the life of his children. Fathers must, in fact, train their sons. This is what Proverbs chapter 19 verse 18 says. Discipline your son For there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Now it's likely that whether Solomon or some other wise person uh, wrote this proverb, they were referring back to Deuteronomy chapter 21. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, beginning at verse 18, Deuteronomy chapter 21, beginning at verse 18, the law of Moses states, that for a rebellious, gluttonous, drunkard of a son whose parents cannot control him, the outcome 
is the death penalty. And so the wise author of this proverb is saying, if you will discipline, that is, if you will train your son, there is hope for him. If you will train your son, it is not likely that he will reach the point of being so rebellious, of being such a glutton, of being such a drunk, that he will come under the threat of the death penalty. Fathers who fail to be godly adults, Uh, Fathers who fail to train their children to be godly adults set them on a path that leads to danger. They may act in reckless fashion and lose their lives. I can remember being in Greek 1 class. And my professor was talking about at that time his daughter who was not even yet in kindergarten. I think she's in middle school now, so that's how quickly time passes. But he said, you know, we don't have to punish her very often. But I had to spank her the other day because she ran out into the road. And I had told her no more than once about this. And he said, it hurt my heart to spank her but it would have hurt far it hurt far less than it would have if she had been hit by a car discipline training involves both the reinforcement of good behavior and the turning away of dangerous behavior if fathers fail to train their children they may end up in danger incarcerated or even worse Now I have a unique opportunity today and and I hope you'll forgive me for taking it. But as we close each point, I want to think about these verses in direct application of my life and the responsibility that was recently laid upon me with my son. And so I hope to impress upon my son the importance of paying attention to himself physically. Now what do I mean by that? Of protecting his life. And doing that involves both the things that I teach him in word and the things that I teach him by example. And so I hope to do the following. To take care of my own health through attention to diet and exercise as well as as abstaining from drugs and alcohol and other addictive substances except maybe coffee. I hope to set him an example by honoring his mother and serving her. If I do so, he will see authority figures as those who have his best interest at heart by first seeing that in me and his mother. By working for an honest wage and using my financial resources to provide for our family and for those who are less fortunate than we are. Now the fact is, even if I keep those goals before me, I will undoubtedly fail at various points. But I will do my son a disservice if I hide those failures from him. Because I will set for him a false, toxic expectation of perfection, both in myself and in himself. As David lay on his deathbed, the first thing that he impressed upon his son was the importance of paying attention to himself physically. He then turned his attention to the spiritual in verse 3. David knew very well the value of obedience to God. In his own life, he had experienced it quite vividly. He understood what some people do not. That God's commands, you see all the different words that David uses, statutes, commandments, rules, testimonies, law, etc. David understood that these are not given to oppress God's people, but to bless them. When we read the Old Testament, we may get the impression that the Old Testament law, the law of Moses, was impossibly difficult to follow. And the fact is, it was very difficult to follow. And 
probably impossible for anyone but Jesus to obey perfectly. Even so, God gave His law, as David says, so that His people could prosper in all that they did. Now, as we've said, David experienced this both in positive and negative fashion. Prior to him, God had selected a man by the name of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin to be king. Yet, God took the crown from Saul's head because of disobedience. And He selected David, who was of no relation to Saul physically, to be the king because of David's heart of faithfulness to God. And so David knew very well the value and the blessing that comes with obedience. He also knew very well the consequences that come from disobedience. In his own life, and in the actions that he took with Bathsheba, and the death at his hands of her husband Uriah, Solomon's own mother, David had disobeyed God, but also brought a curse upon himself and his family for generations to come. David wanted for his son to take hold of the blessings that God extended through his word. According to Deuteronomy chapter 17, beginning at verse 18, the kings of Israel, this is long before any king in Israel had been anointed. God commanded that the kings in Israel write a copy of, of the law of Moses by hand. Now, if you've got your Bible with you this morning, most of us have our uh, a Bible that has typeface from somewhere from 8 point to perhaps at the largest 14 point if we've got an extra large Bible. You can just look at how many pages uh, are covered by the first five books of what we call the Old Testament. Here I am, Deuteronomy ends in my Bible on page 213. Well, you know as well as I do that none of us could write by hand in letters this size. I think it would be easy to suggest in English, writing by hand at normal size, some 500 handwritten pages for the Law of Moses. So what a dawning task this must have been for the kings of Israel to write by hand the law of Moses. Yet the purpose was not to have another physical copy of the law. The purpose of the command in Deuteronomy chapter 17 was for the king to know and understand the law of Moses because he had spent enough time with it that he could apply it both to himself and to his people. He was not writing the law simply by hand, on paper. He was writing the law on his heart. And David is reminding Solomon of this responsibility in the words that he spoke to him in 1 Kings chapter 2. The fact is, as important as our physical well-being is, our spiritual health is far more important. This is what Paul says to his son in the faith, Timothy, In 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Once again, as I think about David's words to King Solomon, I hope to impress upon my son the importance of paying attention to himself physically, but even more so spiritually. And this means teaching him not just what the Bible says, but how to live it. It means modeling for him a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that includes personal prayer and Bible study. You know, I'm the son of a preacher. His father was not a preacher, but you know the jokes about preacher's kids, 
Now I'm sure some of them are founded and some of them are not. But I wonder sometimes if the reason that some preacher's kids, not all, go astray is because they only ever see their fathers studying the Bible so that they can tell someone else what to do. And not studying it to deepen their own relationship with God and the life that follows that relationship. So I must model for him a relationship of personal prayer and study. A relationship that includes public and private worship of God, not because of some sense of obligation, not because of habit, but because of a desire to worship a God who has loved me so much and done so much that I can't help but praise Him in His goodness. I must model for him a relationship that includes telling others about the good things that God has done for me and Jesus Christ and how that can change a life. I must model for him a relationship with God that includes a daily evaluation of myself and whether or not I am serving to the best of my ability. And I must model for him a relationship with God that includes repentance. One serious danger that we all must guard against is that our faith becomes nothing more than habit. If Amos sees that my Christian faith is just something that I do because that's just what we do, then I will have failed him. On his deathbed, David instructed his son to pay attention to himself physically, to pay attention to himself spiritually, and to pay attention to God's promises. David hoped in God's word. Specifically, David had set his hope on God's promise that was delivered to him through the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God told David through Nathan that of his descendants, God would make an eternal dynasty, a kingdom forever. Now, you can see here in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 4 that David says, If your sons pay close attention, then you will not lack a man on the throne. That is not present in the promise that we find in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But the same wording that David uses here in 1 Kings 2 is also found in Psalm 132 verse 12, as well as in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 25. It's interesting though to note That even though David says, if your sons will be faithful, then you will not lack one on the throne. His sons were not all faithful. Solomon turned away from God at the end of his life. His son Rehoboam was not faithful. And many more of David's descendants who sat upon the throne were entirely wicked. Yet in spite of this, God continued to uphold his end of the bargain by placing David's descendants on the throne in Israel until they went into captivity by Babylon. Yet in this promise, there was yet still hope because by it and through it comes our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is a descendant of David, of the tribe of Judah, and who is a perfect king who rules over his people in righteousness and peace. I recently read about a town in Maine called Flagstaff. Flagstaff, Maine. Somewhere along 1950, plans were established to widen Flagstaff, what is now Flagstaff Lake, so that it could feed a hydroelectric dam. The plans for widening that lake included submerging several cities in Maine, of which Flagstaff was one. Once the plans were finalized and the people knew that Flagstaff, Maine would be underwater within a few months, 
life there changed dramatically. People began to move away. Businesses began to close. All thoughts of the future for Flagstaff, Maine evaporated. No more building projects. No more renovations. Why try to keep up a building or a home that will soon be underwater? Where there is no hope for the future, there is no power in the present. The missionary Adoniram Judson is often quoted as having said, the future is as bright as the promises of God. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. When I look at the world around us, and when we found out we were going to have a child, we didn't know there was going to be this global pandemic. When I look at the world around us and I see all of the hurts, all of the difficulties, all of the injustices, all of the problems, it's easy for me to be discouraged for my son. What kind of life will he face in this world? Yes, I can be discouraged when I look at the bad things. But when I remember my good God and the good things that he has promised, I can be encouraged. I want to notice just a few of those promises as we come to a close this morning. David hoped in the promises that God had given to him, and you and I as well have the ability to hope in God's promises. We have the promise of salvation. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter told those present on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And verse 39 says, This promise is for you and for your children, for those who are far off, all those whom the Lord our God calls. We have the promise, if we obey the gospel, of salvation. We have the promise of providence. Romans 8 verse 28 says, that we know that all things work together for good, for those who love the Lord, for those who are called according to His purpose. That doesn't mean we won't face difficulties and hurts and injustices and problems. It means as the people of God, we can still find good in them. We have the promise of forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. We have the promise of joy. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. When I want what God wants, then I will know joy and peace and contentment even in a broken world. We have the promise of wisdom. James chapter 1 and verse 5 says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of the Father who gives all things generously. We have the promise that God has a place prepared for those who follow Jesus Christ. Jesus told His disciples not to be troubled. He was getting ready to leave them, but He was going to prepare a place for them in the Father's house. The future is as bright as the promises of God. I want my son to place his hope in God's promises. On his deathbed, David left his son Solomon a few simple instructions to pay attention to himself physically, to pay attention to himself spiritually, and to pay attention to the promises of God 
all of us would do well to pay attention to these things. And as a father, I hope to help my son do the same. Perhaps you need to respond to the Lord today. Maybe you need to take hold of those promises that God has offered to those who would obey Him through Jesus Christ. If you believe that He is the Christ, you're willing to turn from your life of sin and confess His name, we'll be glad to baptize you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll rise up, a child of God, an heir of the promises of God, ready to walk in a new life. If you are a child of God, and you need to confess some public sin to this congregation, or if you simply need some prayers and encouragement, you're invited to come as we sing together. This time we'll we'll bow for the uh, the loaf. Our dear uh, heavenly Father, we're thankful to thee for this loaf, which represents your Son's body that was sacrificed on the cross for our sins. We pray, Father, that as we partake of it, we would center our thoughts upon Christ and His suffering, or the hope and the blessings that we enjoy through His suffering and, and giving His life for us, that He paid the price for our sins on the cross. For these things we do offer in his name, Christ Jesus, amen.
Let's pray. Good Lord in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity of partaking of this cup. I know, Lord, we can never know the suffering that you went through. But we do know, Lord, that you did it for us. We do love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Clay. Remember that the offering plates are at the end in the foyer, so if there's any other things I need to announce, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you to thank you for this day, Father, the, to come into your house and worship you and recognize our fathers as his fathers today. Father, we recognize you as the most blessed Father that a man could ever have. Father, we ask you to be with us as we go our separate ways today. And Father, we thank you for all of our fathers, our present fathers here and fathers of our past. Father, we thank you for them that taught us that the difference between right and wrong. Father, we ask you now to be with us as we go through this week. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.